we have to talk about Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett and whether or not she's getting a bad reputation among the Second Amendment community on a lot of these bulletin boards and commentary sections of various websites because of her decision specifically to say that the ghost gun regulations of Joe Biden should remain in effect while the ghost gun litigation is being processed and handled in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals and ultimately, presumably, in the U.S. Supreme Court. Let's talk about some inside baseball, but the Supreme Court is likely thinking, and whether or not Amy Coney Barrett is really a problem when it comes to the Second Amendment. Stay tuned. Hey folks, I'm Mark Smith, host of the Four Box of Diner, proud American gun owner, constitutional attorney, member of the United States Supreme Court Bar, and author of First They Came for the Gun Owners, the A to Z guide about how the anti-gunners intend to take away our rights and how you can stop them. All right, folks, so over the last month or so, there's been two setbacks in the U.S. Supreme Court on emergency applications from Merrick Garland's Department of Justice in both cases involving the Vanderstock Blackhawk case, which is the legal challenge down there in Texas to the so-called ghost gun regulations of Joe Biden, which is essentially an attempt to redefine what a firearm is under the NFA and the Gun Control Act by saying it's not just a frame and a receiver, but also parts of frames and receivers and also to encompass what are known as weapon parts kits. And as you may recall, first, there was a decision by the federal district court judge in Texas under the uh, Administrative Procedural Act that also went to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals as to whether or not the ghost gun regulation should be vacated under the Administrative Procedural Act, a remedy known as vacator, and the Fifth Circuit said, indeed, yes, it should. And that was immediately appealed in the context of an emergency application to the U.S. Supreme Court by the Merrick, Merrick Garland's Department of Justice saying that vacator should not be entered against the federal government and these regulations by the lower court. It should be stayed pending the complete outcome of the litigation involving the ghost gun regulations. In a five to four decision in the Vanderstock case, Amy Coney Barrett and Chief Justice John Roberts sided with the three, three liberals on the court who hate guns to say that indeed the Department of Justice regulations involving ghost gun regulations should remain in effect pending the ultimate result of the litigation. In other words, for the moment, it will still be the law of the land. They went back down to the federal district court trial court in Texas at which point he then entered an injunction against the Department of Justice saying they could not enforce these rules against the parties to the case and entered what is known as an injunction, which is a different kind of remedy than vacator. And that went up to the Fifth Circuit. That was upheld. And then, of course, Merrick Garland again went to the U.S. Supreme Court saying, Mother, may I, or please, Mother, please, Mother, save me. Um, please stop the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals from enjoining these quote-unquote ghost gun regulations that even though we that the Department of Justice redefined something that had been the law for 50 years. We think our regulation is good. And again, in a decision by the Supreme Court, we don't know the breakdown, but presumably it was five to four or something like that. Uh, they said, indeed, the injunction entered against the Department of Justice in the ghost gun issue should be stayed as well. Now, these two decisions by the Supreme Court, first one being five to four with Barrett and Roberts with the liberals, against really Second Amendment interest, have caused a lot of people to complain that Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Amy Coney Barrett, is a uh, traitor to the Second Amendment, that she's no good on the gun issue and something's happened to her. So let me be very clear. I don't know exactly what Amy Coney Barrett's thinking, but I am highly skeptical of any claim that Justice Barrett is not good on guns, is not good on the Second Amendment. There's a lot of other reasons why uh, Chief Justice Roberts and Amy Coney Barrett did what they did in the Vanderstock case. And I want to go through those. Now, I can't tell you what ultimately motivated them and whether or not Justice Amy Coney Barrett hates the Second Amendment all of a sudden. But I think that is highly unlikely based on a whole host of reasons, which I'm going to articulate now. To begin with, let's just keep in mind who Justice Amy Coney Barrett is. She is a groundbreaking judge when it comes to to advancing the right to keep and bear arms in America. What do I mean by that? Keep in mind that one of the reasons why she was elevated to the U.S. Supreme Court from her job as a federal court of appeals judge by President Trump was because of her decision when she wrote a dissent in a lower court case called Cantor versus Barr. 
Cantor versus Barr, if you watch me on Fox News, you know I talked a lot about this during the Barrett confirmation days. In Cantor versus Barr, that was a case as to whether or not a nonviolent felon lost the Second Amendment rights because he was convicted of a nonviolent felony, which is often referred to as the Martha Stewart problem, where you have someone like Martha Stewart who has never heard a fly, she's never done anything violent in any respect, and yet under federal law, 18 U.S.C. 922 G1, she's lost her right to keep and bear arms for life. It's the Martha Stewart question. But it is Justice Amy Coney Barrett, who really for the first time in American history, literally wrote a robust, many, many, I forgot it was like 40 pages or 50 pages long dissent, explaining that nonviolent felons, in her view of the Second Amendment, which is Heller's view of the Second Amendment, do not lose their right to keep and bear arms. This is a position that was really to the right, believe it or not, of even the public position of the NRA, as I recall at the time, um, very pro-Second Amendment, very pro-right to keep and bear arms. It really caused a stir in the legal community that Justice Barrett did this. So do I think all of a sudden Justice Barrett has gone from staking out a claim really to the right in some ways of the, even the NRA and other gun rights groups, at least their public positions, I should say, uh, and now all of a sudden has gone squishy on the Second Amendment? No. Now, I think that's highly unlikely. I don't think that's what's going on here at all. I want to give you the good news. I do not think that's happening, number one. Number two is, remember Justice Barrett, in addition to her dissent in Cantor versus Barr, she also was one of the six justices, the six to three justices, in Nicerpa versus Bruin that upheld the right to carry guns outside the home in public, that you have a right to have a gun outside the home in public. She wrote a very powerful, well, she can, can agree completely with the majority opinion, the court's opinion, written by Clarence Thomas. She also wrote a short, con, short concurrence, basically indicating that she thinks 1791 is the relevant time period for interpreting the Second Amendment, uh, which is clearly the correct answer. So again, if Justice Barrett was bad on the Second Amendment, she would not have been powerfully in support of the Second Amendment in Nicerpa versus Bruin, which was just two years ago, uh, not even two years ago. So again, I think that... Uh, that speaks highly as to how she views the Second Amendment. Beyond that, let's just keep in mind that Justice Barrett is no wallflower or scaredy cat on taking on quote-unquote controversial decisions. If you look outside of the context of the Second Amendment and her serious views of what the law is and what the Constitution really means, she is, for example, she, well, she voted to overturn Roe v. Wade. You do not... Uh, you cannot be a squish squish jurist if you're willing to overturn Roe v. Wade. That takes real judicial courage, especially given the fact that these justices, when that opinion in Dobbs, which was the decision to overturn Roe, was leaked, that these justices faced death threats. Remember the individual that tried to assassinate Brett Kavanaugh uh, in Maryland, just outside his home there when he was captured by the local police. Uh, keep all that in mind. Nevertheless, despite all that, Amy Coney Barrett stood with the others and overturned Roe v. Wade in the Dobbs case, not a sign of someone that lacks courage. Even if you disagree, the reality was it, it took courage to do what she did. Beyond that, she also was in the majority from the Supreme Court that knocked out race discrimination in the form of affirmative action in universities. She also is part of the court that has agreed that they're going to hear whether or not Chevron should be the law of the land. And I'm pretty sure it's going to get knocked out. And Barrett, I think, will be fully in the camp that knocks out Chevron for once and for all. And don't forget, she also was in the majority in what's known as the major issue doctrine dealing with uh, regulatory oversight or the ability of regula regulatory agencies like the ATF and, and FDA and others to do things without going back to Congress. So Amy Coney Barrett, Justice Barrett, is very good on all these issues, which begs the question of what we're talking about today, which is why would it be that Justice Barrett would quote unquote be bad when it comes to the Vanderstock Blackhawk case dealing with Joe Biden's uh, out of the blue decision or regulation dealing with ghost guns? And here's why, here's why. We're going to get a little geeky here. I'm warning you now, but you'll understand when I'm done with this. First of all, the current composition of the Supreme Court on our side, meaning those that respect the Constitution and the rule of law, they take their job seriously. They do not view themselves as partisan hacks. They view themselves as serious jurors trying to get the law right. This, of course, is a tremendous advantage that the left has in America and has had for many decades, which is that the left-wing justices, Elena Kagan, Sonia Sotomayor, 
uh, Justice Brown Jackson that cannot define what a woman is in her confirmation hearings, it doesn't matter what the law is to uh, those three justices out, if, if it involves anything controversial. I'm not saying they're not going to try to get the law right if it deals with the Internal Revenue Code or an ERISA case or an intellectual property case. Yeah, they'll try to get it right in those contexts because it's not cultural war spoken. But anything that touches on cultural war issues, they're just going to vote as partisan hacks. They're just going to vote as partisan legislators uh, wearing black robes. That's all they're going to do. That's all the left judges ever do. The reason why they feel comfortable doing this is they view that, view that government is a force for good. And anything that can happen where government does good things for the progressive cause is a positive for society. And when we, the people, don't get to the right answer on issues, let's say gay marriage, then it's up to the lib lib liberals on the court to tell we, the people, what we should do when it comes to these cultural value issues. Now, again, I'm not here to debate the good and the bad of this. I think it's wrong. But nevertheless, the point is that the left-wing judges never get things wrong, which is why you never see in a controversial case involving abortion, guns, uh, gay rights, affirmative action, you never see a situation where any left-wing judge comes over and defects to the conservative side of things because that's not how they view the rule of law. And again, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, you have no idea what her ideology was other than the left wing won, the left wings to win. That's the full extent of her judicial philosophy. Left wing causes win was RBG. Simple as that. Nevertheless, let's carry on. Point is that people like Justice Amy Coney Barrett do not approach the law with the mindset of I'm nothing more than a right wing legislator or a left wing legislature. She is trying to get it right. So there's good and bad to that. So some of the issues here that are confronting, I'm sure, Justice Barrett as she thinks through cases like Vanderstock is, for example, what the lower courts did against Donald Trump when Trump was the president. If you think about it back in the day, Donald Trump tried to do a series of executive actions, specifically dealing with, let's say, immigration. He had a lot of different administrative rules. He tried to have uh, you know, regulations and restrictions on certain people trying to immigrate here from the United States or fly to the United States. There was a whole host of things he tried to do to protect the border, and the deep state worked hard against him. And these judges did too. Specifically, you would wake up one day Donald Trump will have issued some executive order trying to protect the border from illegal aliens or whatnot, and you'd wake up the next morning and some judge in Hawaii or some federal district court judge in, in California would come out with enter a nationwide injunction stopping the president of the United States from doing this. And then we'd go to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals or some other crazy court like that, and they would say, indeed, the president doesn't have this power. And next thing you know, the president has to go to the Supreme Court, and it's this sort of, and this is important to understand, that the Justice Barrett, I'm sure, and the other justices are aware of the abuse, the abuse that the lower court, inferior court judges uh, basically heaped upon Donald Trump as president, that they're really all about trying to make sure these inferior courts cannot set policy for the whole country by either uh, issuing injunctions or anything of the like. So I think a big part of what we're seeing here is the Supreme Court trying to send messages to these inferior courts, don't behave like this. You do not get to enter an injunction that applies to the whole country. You do not get to vac do vacator that applies to the whole country. That's not your job. Our job as the Supreme Court is we do things for the whole country, but we're not going to let some federal district court judge in Texas or in Hawaii or in Massachusetts set policy for the executive branch. That is up to the president. And I think part of the problem here is that you know, to be honest as jurists, Justice Barrett is thinking, well, we would not allow a single federal district court judge or a court of appeals to enter an injunction that would prevent President Trump from doing something with an executive order. So therefore, we're not going to do it when it comes to allowing a lower federal district court judge or a court of appeals to do the exact same thing to President Biden because it's disrespectful to the separation of powers between the executive branch, which is the presidency, the legislative branch, which is the Congress, and of course the judicial branch, which includes the inferior courts under Article 3 in addition to the Supreme Court. So I think that's part of the problem we're facing here. The other thing is just a practical... So, so you have that whole thing of like, they don't want a repeat of lower courts taking over the Trump administration. They want to nip that in the butt. That's part of the problem I think that uh, Justice Barrett was concerned with here. The second thing is the so-called shadow docket. Now, this is a, 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 a scary term, which is really kind of a silly concept. All it is, is there are situations where there are these emergency applications made to the Supreme Court that the Supreme Court has to decide 
an issue without the benefit of a full briefing. So the, the way the Supreme Court likes to do it, we're going to talk about what the Supreme Court likes to do first, then we're going to talk about why they don't like shadow docket or these emergency applications and why it's sometimes hard and for our purposes to win. The court, what the Supreme Court wants to do is they want to, when they issue a decision, they understand that everyone follows it. So they want to get it right. And that's why they generally like to have a case fully litigated, completely decided on the merits, final judgment and all that before they get involved. That gives them the benefits of all the lower court decisions, all the lower court arguments, all the lawyers' arguments, and they have the benefit of everything being done in front of them. They have the benefit of the full, complete record. Then they grant certiorari, ori, and they get briefs on both sides. Now, I printed out here, these are the briefs in, in, in the Rahimi case. That's the United States versus Rahimi. Okay, these are one half, one half of the briefs that the Supreme Court is going to have to read to decide the Rahimi case. One half. These are the briefs submitted by the pro-government side against the Second Amendment side. I just want to show you the size. This is the briefs. In every one of these briefs, you probably have upwards of 50 to 100 or more footnotes of citations to law and history and social science studies and whatnot. So this is half. Take that amount of paper I just showed you and double it. And that's the number of briefs and arguments and materials that the Supreme Court is going to have the benefit or the burden of reading to make sure they get the Rahimi decision correctly in U.S. versus Rahimi. So when you're dealing with it, so when you're dealing with an emergency application, like in the Vanderstock case, you're not getting all that information. You're probably, and I'm going to just guess, you're probably getting something along the order of this in terms of all the papers submitted by both sides, because it's an emergency application. There are no amicus briefs. Uh, there's not the opportunity to full briefing. Everything is done fast. And when you're dealing with these interlocutory appeal issues, meaning the case is not over, it's still going on, the Supreme Court really hates to get involved with these because, again, they want the benefit of all the information so they can get it right the first time. They don't like to sort of get it half right or half wrong. That's not how they do things. So I think... The presumption is that they rule in favor of the government. So if there's a question about regulation and its legitimacy, they tend to say we're going to trust the executive branch who also swears an oath to the Constitution to do it right. This does not say that we're going to not strike it down eventually. It just means in the short run, we're not going to let a lower court judge knock it out and eliminate that executive order, whether it be against President Trump or against President Biden. And I think that's a big part here. They want to get it right and they really want all the materials. And the only way they get all the materials, including all the amicus briefs, is after there's a final judgment and they grant cert and then they litigate it in the normal course and not in a rush, rush, rush fashion. fashion. Keep in mind these, these briefs that come in, as you know, they will get an emergency application from the Department of Justice like on a Wednesday and they will issue a decision on it like seven or eight days later. That is simply not nearly the amount of time that they use take to really figure out all the ramifications of case, which is why they generally don't like to enjoin federal regulations or federal laws in that context, because they're nervous that down the road, they will have gotten it wrong. And the last thing about the ghost gun regulations and why I don't think you should despair about Justice Barrett and Justice Roberts' decision to side with the liberals uh, in this context. And by the way, I'm not an apologist here. I'm not saying that I love this. I'm not saying that I agree with this. I'm just trying to give you the reality on the ground of what I think is really happening here. It doesn't mean I'm happy. It doesn't mean I like it, but it's not my job to be happy and to like stuff to tell you what I think is happening. It's much more important that I give you what I think is going on. That's where it's valuable. Now, we may not all like the information, but at least it's good to have the good information so we can make good choices going forward. And I think the last thing that's going on here, and I don't like this uh, as a guy who supports economic liberty or property rights, there's also, I think, a bias historically by the U.S. Supreme Court against dealing with cases that involve commercial context, meaning business relationships, contracts, things like this. They generally don't like to get involved with this. Now, if you think about the situation with the ghost gun regulations, it involves the sale, the sale of weapon parts kits or the sale of parts of receivers or parts of frames. Uh, now, again, from the Supreme Court's point of view, they look at this and they're thinking, 
This is not so much a Second Amendment issue. This is really a commercial transaction problem. We tend not to get too involved with commercial transactions. That involves money. It's not really a big constitutional thing in our view. Uh, and it's kind of the industry can fight its own battles against the regulators. And it happens all the time. You know, the banks fight the banking regulators. So why not let the gun industry fight the gun regulators and the ATF? So I think there's kind of a bias to kind of not get involved with commercial transactions unless they really need to. So in light of that, I think also there was a desire to say, well, you know, we're, we're not really dealing with a fundamental right to keep in their arms in these cases. We're really just dealing with whether or not these particular devices, these objects uh, are constitute firearms and thus give rise to a background check or not. And thus we're not really feeling this is a second amendment fundamental right issue as much as just uh, regulating commercial transactions in the firearms industry, which is important they're thinking, but it's not the sort of thing the Supreme Court really is gonna dive into under these circumstances until they get a final ruling. It's not the sort of thing they wanna jump into and, and shut down the federal government's regulations over an industry on an interlocutory basis. It's kind of not what they do at the Supreme Court. And I think all these are reasons why I think Justice Barrett and Justice Roberts did what they did. But do I think if the ghost gun case gets to the U.S. Supreme Court on and it's fully briefed and it's fully litigated completely, I think the I think the ATF is dead meat. I think they're I think they're dead meat. I think they're dead meat if that case goes. And the same with the pistol races. I think these are going to be opportunities for the U.S. Supreme Court to spank. Uh, to spank these anti-gun uh, you know, bureaucrats at the Department of Justice and Merrick Garland, uh, but I think it's just not the time for them to do it. It doesn't make me happy. It is frustrating to me as a Second Amendment supporter, but I think that's why we have to deal with this delay, which, yeah, is crappy, but it's the world we live in and uh, nothing we can do right now other than be aware of it and move forward and do the best we can. All right, folks, hope you learned a little bit something here today. If you haven't subscribed to the Four Boxes Diner, please do so, share it with your friends, and don't forget to follow me on X at Four Boxes Diner, and we will see you again soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.